Turn with me to your Bibles, to Hebrews chapter number 4, starting with verse number 14. Hebrews chapter number 4, starting with verse number 14. Hallelujah. Again, it's good to see everyone. Y'all look so pretty today. Amen. Everyone, y'all look so nice and pretty. I'm telling you. You look like you got on your teeth. <laughs> That's how pretty you are. <laughs> Hebrews chapter number four, starting with verse number 14. Amen. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Amen? For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen for God's word. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning with God's help today. You've got somebody in your corner. You've got somebody in your corner. Father, Lord, I just ask for your help. I ask for your strength. I ask for your anointing, Father. Oh, to help me to speak this word that you've given to me. Not for me, but to your saints, Lord. To your saints, Father. Lord, I just ask that you help me, strengthen me, give me wisdom to say the things that you would have me to say, Father. Lord, get flesh out of the way, but Lord, let them see you high and lifted up, not out of white. Oh, no, Jesus, but let them see you. Let them see you, Father. And I ask that you for your help, for your strength in this moment of time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You have someone in your corner. Amen. I'm reminded of a song that I used to, that I like and I still like. It's an old song. It's a, it's very famous. It's in a, it's one of the I guess they said that it was one of the most pioneer songs to hit rock and roll. And it was written, but the person that made it famous wasn't the one that originally sang it. It was a person by the name of Jerry Lee Lewis called Whole Lot of Shaking Going On. <laughs> I love that song. Whole Lot of Shaking Going On. <laughs> well, what's interesting is I actually saw some of the recording when he was a young man and he was playing that piano and he'd go on that thing and he had long hair and he'd flip it back when he'd do that whole lot of shaking going on and all them people just shake and shimmy and all that. Oh, he just rocked up that crowd and everything. It's a good song. I love that song. I love the old, old songs. But what made you think about that is simply the fact that there's one word that describes our current situation right now. That there's a whole lot of shaking going on. <laughs> In fact, the one word I have is this, emotional. Emotional. Oh, we are a very emotional people right now in this time. Hey, Amen. There's a lot of things that are happening, a, lot, a whole lot of shaking going on. Hey, Amen. Things that are happening and everything like that. And there are people that feel numb. There's people that feel angry and afraid. They're anxious. They're irritated. They're unsettled, etc., etc. There's a lot of emotion that, that people, when we come across them, when we see them, we're on the phone, even ourselves, that we experience this emotional state that we're in. Amen? In fact, it's so bad that it's the smallest things that can set someone off. The smallest things that can set someone off. Let me tell you what I had to deal with uh, Friday uh, at work. I was sitting there, I was by myself, and um, 
tiddling and doing some things. It's very slow, and so I was able to, during this time, it is very slow. We've got snowbirds, and they're there for months on end and everything, and so I'm fiddling around, and I'm doing the things that need to be done, and all that, some maintenance stuff and everything, and this person comes in, this lady, and she comes in, and she says, you met the nice one, but now you met the bulldog. And I said, okay. <laughs> she said, and I mean, she gave me a piece of her mind. She just told me everything that was wrong and everything, this and that and that and that. And then she said to me, and another thing, y'all ruined my vacation. Everybody, y'all ruined it. Because y'all allowed that drive on that beach. That disgusts me. Who came up with that? And I looked at her and I said, Ma'am, it was something before me and you were ever asked. <laughs> and she didn't like that answer, and I said, oh, I should have said that. <laughs> but it's the truth. Nobody asked me. This was long before. Lord, this was people been traveling on that beach for years, and she got mad at everything. So I just got highly perturbed. I thought, how dare that lady come up to me in my office here and mind my own business trying to do work, and here she is arguing and fussing and mad at me, getting mad at me. I've done nothing. And here she is telling me, I'll tell you what, I ain't going to help her with nothing. I'll tell you what. I mean, she was mad. It made me mad. I about ready to throw the pull away wide and just and jump on the chairs and tables and everything else, kick the dog and everything else. So she had, there was a, something that she needed, so I went and I was driving, and I'm glad that I went and I drove because it allowed me to cool off. Because uh, the Lord began to talk to me and said, you notice one thing, notice one thing that she said all of this. And so it was that she was upset because she had rented a house last month, different company, and there was problems that the neighbor helped. So because there was a problem at this current new house she was at, she thought she wasn't going to get any help. And so she, that just threw her off. And just, and I said to myself, well, you know what? If I had the same situation, and I was, I'd be probably upset too. If I stayed in the house and nobody was trying to help me and all those kind of things. And, you know, just people aren't helpful. And, you know, I'm sure she got aggravated. And that's the state of affairs we're in right now. <laughs> Amen? Amen. It's true that we are so just full of emotions, raw emotions, because of whatever reason. Election, laws, COVID, being separated from people. I mean, it's just, it's horrible the day and age that we live in. But it's true the smallest things can set us off if we're not careful. See, folks, we got to understand that emotions are a part of our lives. Amen. God doesn't expect us to be robots. Amen? we got to have some emotions. I looked up and a, and a person did a research. I didn't, this is just what he said. I didn't prove his work or anything like that. But they studied and said that Jesus, in the Word, showed 39 different emotions. 39 different emotions. When he looked at Jerusalem and people rejected God, he grieved. When the religious leaders cared more about rules than people, he was angry. 72 followers described how God used them and Jesus was overjoyed. His friend Lazarus died and he weeped in sadness. Before the cross, he was discouraged he was lonely, and he was in spiritual agony. Jesus was all man and all God. You can't explain that. That is something that is beyond our understanding, but truth. And knowing that yet Jesus was all flesh, in the same time, he was all God. And he experienced these things, these emotions that we have. And as we read here, it said that he was tempted, but without sin. Without sin. Hallelujah. See, church, we must be careful not to allow our emotions to control us. 
Uh, Jeremiah 17 and 9 talks about the heart is wicked and deceitful. But then when you read verse 10, it says that the Lord, God, searches the heart and is the only one that can judge it. Because our emotions are so raw. Our emotions are so just they can get the best of us. That's why in Galatians, Paul says that we've got to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. We have to guard these emotions that we have. And they can sometimes get the best of us like they did me. They, they do all of us sometimes. There's little things that will happen and man, we'll just get upset and mad. Hallelujah. Or we'll get sad or we'll get lonely. It's not all about just being angry all the time. But there's depression. There's loneliness. There's sadness. There's just feeling uh, numb. Just feel like, well, it's just another day. Nothing's going to change. I'm just going to go with the flow. Not going to do nothing extra. Not going to, just going to do what is required of me. There's many in this word that, that many faithful that were overcome by their emotions. Moses. Moses. And Numbers. Uh, I forget the chapter, but it was right when Miriam had died. And he took them to a place where there was no water. And the children of Israel started grumbling and complaining to Moses and Aaron. And they said, Moses, you just let us here to die. And so Moses and Aaron went before the face of God and they and he told them, he said, you go to that rock and you speak to that rock and, and the uh, water will come out of that rock and it'll, it'll water them. And when Moses got up there, he told them, you bunch of rebels. <laughs> he was so mad. He called them, you bunch of rebels. And he hit that rock two times. God didn't tell him to do that. But oh, what a penalty he paid. Him and Aaron. He couldn't go into that promised land. In fact, a few more verses after that story, they take them, uh, Moses takes Aaron and his son up, strip Aaron of his priestly robe, places it on his son, and Aaron dies. And they weep for 30 days for that. Peter was one that had, was overcome by emotions. He cut the ear of one of the guards that was coming after Jesus. He was mad. But then a few days later, he denied and cussed, cussed him out and said, I don't know this Jesus. He was full of emotions. Abraham, the list can go on and on and on. But church, even though sometimes our emotions get the best of us, and sometimes even we just fail our own selves on how we act. I'm going to tell you something. We have somebody that cares for you. You've got somebody that's, all, that's in your corner. I think it's sometimes Rocky. Uh, the, those movies, Rocky, when he had that, uh, that, uh, that guy over the top of the corner, right? and he was back behind him, and he would help him and do all those things to help Rocky. You've got somebody that's in your corner this morning. I don't know what you're dealing with, and I don't know, but God knows, and God says, I'm right in your corner this morning. Hallelujah. It's good to have an acquaintance, and it's good to have a friend. Because you can talk to your friend. You can talk to your acquaintance about things like that, about problems and issues like that. But church, there is someone that's even better, and it's even better to have someone that sympathizes with you, that knows exactly how you feel. Yes. Hallelujah. You know, there's sometimes where someone comes up and there's an issue, and I don't understand. I really, truly don't understand what they're going through. And sometimes we'll use words like, well, bless your heart. Bless your heart, I just, I, I just feel for you. Not to be rude or critical or anything like that. It's just, I'm sorry for you. I just don't really know how you feel. But then there's some things. There's some things in life where you can say, hey, I've been exactly where you were. I know exactly how it feels and all of that kind of stuff. And church, it's so good to have somebody that you can go to that says, hey, I know exactly how you feel. I sympathize with you. It can sometimes seem that we can't find people like that anymore. Because people now are prone to gossip. They're prone to judge. They're prone to ridicule. They'll, 
Turn to tell you this. <laughs> there's some people. You know, there's some people I can't tell stuff to because they'll run and tell it. And there's vice versa. You know people in your life that you're like, well, I can't tell everything to everybody because they'll be the total, the whole world and everything else. And I just don't like Facebook because, you know, people just put nonsense on Facebook. And it's like, why do you put stuff like that? You, it ain't none of your business to say some stuff. But, but sometimes people will help line up your emotional merry-go-round. <laughs> well, they do it. Oh, sometimes people will do it and they'll just help, help you wind up that emotional merry-go-round. But church, we found a help today and it's Jesus. Jesus. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. I'll fail you. Your friends will fail you. Your family will disappoint you. People will let you down. Co-workers, bosses, whoever, acquaintances, friends, best friends, BFFs, sisters, whatever it is. People are going to let you down. We're human. We mess up. But folks, I'm going to tell you something. I know somebody that hasn't failed me yet. I know somebody that's in my corner. I know somebody that's going to help me in the times of trouble. I know somebody that I can run to when I've got a problem, when I've got a situation, when there's something happening that I can run to. And oh, he'll be that help to me. He'll be that help. Notice in verse 15, it says that he's touched. He's touched with the feelings of our infirmity. He's touched. That word touched, he's meaning he's touched by our weaknesses. Infirmities really is what, what I was looking at. That word infirmities. It's being that he's touched by our weaknesses, our lack of strength, even our illness, physical and spiritual. He is concerned and he is touched by our infirmities. By our problems, by our moments of weakness, by the things that get us down, that knock us down so much. Oh, my Jesus is touched by it. But church, a beautiful thing is that word touched. He sympathizes with us. And that word, when you looked it up, when I looked it up in the Greek, it meant to experience pain jointly. To suffer with. Think about that for just one moment. Think about something in your life that you've got a weakness on. Think of something in your life that kind of gets you sometimes. And I'm not talking about drinking and smoking and <laughs> nothing like that. But it can include that. It includes anything in your life where you say, God, I need help with this. Jesus is not the one that says, you ought to know better than that. I did not redeem you. And no, he don't kick us. But he says he sympathizes. He feels our pain. He knows exactly how we feel. Ain't that wonderful? Ain't that beautiful? That my Jesus ain't sitting somewhere high and it feels like we're a million miles away and I can never reach him. But oh, he's right in my corner. Oh, hallelujah. He's right in my corner. And he sees me. And he knows where I'm at. And it's not only that he sees me, church, but he feels what I feel. When I'm hurt, he's hurt. When I'm sad, he's sad. When I'm alone, he feels that same way with us. Oh, he knows. He truly knows how we feel this morning. He knows it. He knows it. And church, the best way that I can give you an example of, because I've told you all these things, but I'm going to give you an example, because the proof is in the pudding. Luke chapter 7, verses number 11. We find a story of Jesus, and he's walking, and there's a big crowd that's around him. And he's walking, and he looks, and he sees a lady. And there's a funeral possession. Verse 11, it says this. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him. And much people. And now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out. The only son of his mother. 
and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. Now look at verse 13. And when the Lord saw her. Stop. When the Lord saw her. You know, I can tell you a lot about what this Bible says. And I can give you examples. And like I just did a few moments ago, I talked to you about your emotions, how our emotions can get the best of us, how we can guard. But the wonderful thing is Jesus is by our side and Jesus is there. He said he was. That's all good. But there's some that say, well, you know what? you got to prove it to me. How do I know that Jesus is going to be in my corner? We go, I'm going to show it to you right here in verse number 13. You see, it says here that he noticed her. He noticed her. He already saw her. In the midst of crowds, in the midst of people, his disciples, and many others, in the midst of all of that, Jesus can still see your need. <laughs> It don't matter if you're in a crowd full of thousands or a few. I want to tell you, Jesus can narrow down where you're at and see your need. Sister Cindy, he sees your need. Brother Bob, he sees your need. Brother Jonathan, he sees your need. Sister Shirley, he sees your need. Mama, he sees your needs today. It don't matter if this crowd and this few or many, he can still see it. You notice here there was many disciples with them and much people. And it even said that the widow woman, there was much people in that place with her. There was a whole lot of crowd, a whole lot of people going on with different needs, with probably different things, with sicknesses, with illnesses, probably sad and lone and all that. But Jesus noticed that widow woman. Oh, church, I'm telling you. Hallelujah. One thing that can wreck our emotion is the feeling of loneliness. Loneliness. Think about that. You can be in a crowd full of people but still be lonely. You can be in a crowd full of people and still be lonely. I'm reminded of a story about a frog one day. This frog was very lonely, and he was just upset with himself, so he decided he was going to go see a fortune teller. So he hops on down to the street, and he goes and sees the fortune teller. And he begins to tell her, oh, how lonely he is and how everything is just miserable because he doesn't have somebody with him, and he's just lonely, and he just needs help. And so the, <coughs> the uh, uh, fortune teller does whatever she does and says, all right, I see that you are going to meet a very beautiful young lady. And the frog, he just got so excited because he thought, oh, I'm going to not be lonely no more. Oh, I'll be excited. I won't be lonely. I'll have somebody with me. Can you tell me, fortune teller, when is this going to happen? And the fortune teller did her cards and looked at her crystal ball and said, hmm, next semester at biology class. <laughs> <laughs> Next semester at biology class, he won't be alone. <laughs> it's horrible being alone. It's horrible to feel like you're the only one that's going through something. It's a horrible experience to feel that you are just by yourself. But folks, can I tell you, again, Jesus can get her down where you're at and he sees where you're going. Psalms 33 and 18 says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. Proverbs 15 and 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. 2 Chronicles 16 and 9, one of my new favorites. It says, For the eye of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. 1 Peter 3 and 12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. No matter how hard you try, you will never escape the eye of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah, you'll never escape that eye that looks and sees the righteous. How many are righteous this 
morning? How many of you are part of that crew of the righteous, the saints this morning? Can I tell you, when you live right and when you do right, and you do your best to serve your Lord and Savior, He sees where you're going. Okay. He notices everything. And all it says is He is inclined to you. Oh, praise God forevermore. He sees and he notices. Next thing in the same verse of 13, it said that he saw her, and then he said that he had compassion on her. He had compassion on her. He felt. He felt. He felt. He was filled with tenderness. That word, compassion, I'm going to try and pronounce it. Splanchosoma. <laughs> That's kind of, it's a weird word. But that word means to have the bowels yearn. To feel sympathy, to pity, to have or be moved with compassion. We get that word and we, we use that word for spleen or intestine. That means that it is a deep, deep hurt, like your stomach hurts or you're hurt in the gut. Just a deep pain in your stomach. When Jesus, when that word said that he had compassion on her, when he noticed what was going on, and he had compassion on her. He hurt for that woman. Oh, he sympathized with that woman. Oh, folks, can I tell you? Jesus hurts over our hurts. Jesus hurts over our sorrows. Jesus hurts over us when we're in distress. Jesus hurts when we're in trouble and we're in a situation and we look to him and say, God, I need your help. He looks at us with that same compassion as he looked at that widow woman that hurt, that yearning, oh, that same pain. It says that if you are his, then you matter to him. Church, get that. If you're his, then you matter. It don't matter what matters in your life. He's concerned about it. He may think that it's small and insignificant, but if it touches your heart, if it's something that bothers you, I want to let you know that Jesus don't pass by and say, well, that's stupid, that's wrong. He feels the same way and says, oh, Oh, I feel with you. I understand what you're going through and that hurt and that pain and that sorrow. That's why we can say, cast our cares upon him for he cares for you. He cares for us. He cares for everything. Care here means to be of interest to, to concern or take care of. Oh, church, let me tell you something. He's concerned about us. And to think that God would love us, that he would be concerned about us, that he would be concerned about everything that we're going through. A God who spoke this thing into existence, a Lord that died on a cross for you and our sins and for millions of others that have went on before and that will still come to still think that he'll narrow down and you individually and care just as much as you care. That's my Jesus. That's my Jesus. Oh, I don't know what other Jesus people want to listen to. I don't know what other Jesus people want to go by. But my Jesus is concerned about me. My Jesus hurts when I'm hurting. And my Jesus longs to touch us. Notice the last thing. I'm closing here. The last thing he did. Verses 14 all the way through 15. When he saw that compassion, he told her, don't weep. He said, weep not. And it said that he came and touched, he touched the briar, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak 
and he delivered him to his mother. Oh, church, can I tell you something? It's, it's good to have somebody that feels for you. It's good to have someone that will listen, that will, you can listen to. But you know what? That's all good, but it's useless if somebody can do nothing for you. In, in essence, it's something that's useless. That individual is useless. If all you do is spill your guts, and all they do is say, well, I'm so sorry, I feel exactly how you feel, and cry with us, and they don't do nothing else. Well, church, can I tell you, Jesus, when he saw and noticed that woman, Oh, he was concerned, and what did he do? He went into action. He touched. He touched. He touched. Oh, church, can I tell you? Jesus ain't just looking at us and saying, I feel sorry for you. But oh, he's there that says, I can touch you. I can touch your situation. I can touch your body. I can touch your mind. I can touch your finances. I can touch your family. I can touch this and that and the other. Oh, just one touch yes. of the master's strong hand. Just one touch. Woo! And things begin to happen. Well, notice here when they said in this verse that when he touched it, that they stood still. Folks, can I tell you something? In Jewish law, you weren't supposed to touch the dead. Oh, if you touched anything of the dead, you were considered unclean. You had to leave those people. You had to do this ceremony to be washed, present yourself to the priest and all these things. So when Jesus went by, him, they just stopped and said, did he just touch that? Did I, am, am I saying it right? Did he just, did he notice this woman come over here and touch this thing? Is he crazy? Is he just, is he lost his mind? Folks, can I tell you, there is nothing that my Jesus won't touch. There is nothing. It don't matter. It doesn't matter what it is, either it's a big deal or a little deal. There is nothing that can stay the hand of my God. There is nothing that will bottle, rebuttal the hand of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He can interrupt the funeral. He can interrupt anything else in my life. Because it's just by one touch. Amen. One touch. Amen. One touch. And that man yes. came to life. And then he came out talking. <laughs> he came out talking. And everybody looked and he went and touched that dead man. And he went and presented him to that widow woman. He touched that widow woman and said, here's your son. I don't know how old this child, this kid was. I don't know if he was a toddler, if he was a teen, or if he was a 20-year-old or 30 or whatever it was. I just know that he was once dead, and Jesus touched him, and he came back to life. Oh, hear me this morning, church. God is concerned about you. God is concerned about me, and he's concerned about what we're going through, and there is nothing that his hand can't touch. There is nothing that his hand can't touch and move on our behalf. Hallelujah, church. Oh, it doesn't matter. Our lives are difficult. Living in this world is difficulty. Oh, we're living in a constant wave of emotional highs and lows. You saw on the news where the, where the Supreme Court ruled against California and said, hey, you overstepped. When you close those churches, but then you allow everybody else and the bars and the juke joints and everything else and the filthy stores and all that to be open, but you close the church, that's wrong. Oh, it was good. They said, you can't do that. But the thing about it was they limited the occupancy, which that's normal with businesses and all that, but they still upheld that you can't see. They still upheld it. So you think about that, that emotional high those people in California are feeling. We won, we can open, but you can't sing. You can't speak out. We can't do all those things. Life's full of disappointments. Life's full of problems. Life's full of difficulties. But it, it sometimes seems like things are going, are not going to get back to normal or get better. But church, we're not alone. I want to tell you something. We're not alone. We got somebody in our corner. We got somebody that's in our corner. We got somebody that's back, that's got our back. We got somebody that's right here with us. 
Oh, uh, you may think I'm alone standing up on this stage right now. But can I tell you, I've got somebody in my back. I've got somebody on my back saying, get them. Oh, that's right, Adam. I'm for you. I'm, get, I'm, I'm not against you. We're going to do this thing. There's somebody that, even though you're sitting in a row by yourself, there's somebody next to you that says, hey, you going to make it. Hey, it's going to be all right. I feel what you're feeling. Oh, just wait. Just hold on a little bit longer. Just have that faith to hold on. And when I get to you and I touch you, your situation is going to be better. Amen. Your situations are going to be better because Jesus cares for you. Jesus cares for me, church. I'm telling you, this same God, this same Jesus, oh, is concerned about you and me. Amen. And so, church, there's nothing. There is nothing that seems that is so, um, how can I say it? There is nothing in this world that you feel that is uh, insignificant. If it is concerning you, I'm telling you, he's concerned about it. Yes. There might be other people that, you know, at work and things like that, you may say, well, I've got this problem and this needs to be addressed. And the higher-ups will say, oh, well, you know what? That's fine, but we will work on this. This is more important. And they'll just pass by. I worked at that in the credit union. There were situations that we'd go up to the management and say, hey, we've got a problem with this. And they look and say, well, you know, we understand that, but we're going to work on this. And they would bypass your problem. Can I tell you, Jesus will bypass your problem. I'm telling you, Jesus will pass you by. But, oh, he's right there in the corner. He's right there in the corner. He's right there in the corner. Fighting you on, getting you on, saying, oh, I'm concerned about you. Would you stand this morning? Oh, God, we love you and we praise you. Lord, we love you today and we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, God. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. That, Lord, we're not alone in this thing. Jesus, we're not alone in this fight. Jesus, we are not alone. But, Lord, you are concerned about us. Jesus, you are concerned about us today. And, oh, Jesus, I just ask that you help us to remember. Help us, God, to remember. Remember that you're, on, you're in our corner. you got our back. You're concerned with us. Oh, you are, you are touched by our infirmities. You are touched by our problems and our situations. Lord, there's nothing too big for you to handle. Lord, there's nothing too big for you to handle. And Lord, we just give you thanks. Help us, God, today. Help us, God, today. Lord, to remember that we're not alone in this fight. We're not alone in this fight. But you're with us through the thick and through the thin. Oh, it may seem we're alone, but Jesus, you're with us. You're with us, and you're not going to leave us alone. Oh, thank you, Jesus.